Good evening. Welcome to the earnings review, your tidbits into company financials and operational insights. Thank you for joining us as we broadcast from Hampton Studios in Harare. I'm Ibn Mabunda, yo money man. On the show, we engage top echelon executives to get you up to speed with first-hand information. We also chat with the most competent analysts on the market just to ensure you're finished with relevant and comprehensive market analysis. Tonight, we focus on ZB Financial Holdings, a diversified financial services group. Now, the group offers commercial, mortgage, insurance, as well as investment banking services. The group is also invested in properties. I will take you now through a jog down memory lane to get you up to speed with how the firm has come to be. In 1951, the Netherlands Bank of South Africa opened a unit in the then Salisbury. And in 1967, a key development occurred as the Netherlands Bank of Rhodesia was opened and assumed the operations of the Netherlands Bank of South Africa. Still in 1967, two key units were acquired, which then saw the entity list on the Rhodesia Stock Exchange. In 1970, a vital development also occurred as the bank was renamed the Rowe Bank from the Rhodesia Banking Corporation. Post-independence in 1981, the government of Zimbabwe acquired a controlling stake in the entity, at which point Rowe Bank was transformed to Zimbank. In 1989, a new organization was formed, which was to be known as Finhold, which then assumed Zimbank as one of its key subsidiaries. Fast forward to 2007, Finhold was rebranded ZB Financial Holdings. And in 2007, ZB acquired a controlling stake in Intermarket Holdings Limited. Now, some tidbits in terms of how the organization is actually organized. ZB operates through three key subdivisions, which are insurance, banking, as well as strategic investments. And on the insurance front, it pushes its business agenda through ZB Reinsurance, as well as ZB Life Assurance. On to the banking front, where you find the ZB Bank, which is the group's flagship unit, which contributes more than 70% to revenue all things being equal. You also have under that same unit what they call the ZB Building Society, ZB Capital, as well as ZB Transfer Secretaries. ZB is also invested in Machinaland Holdings, a listed properties concern on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange. ZB is also invested in Cell Holdings, a health insurance entity operating in Zimbabwe. Now onto some vital statistics with the current share price of 500 cents in Zim dollar terms, the entity has a market capitalization of 928 million United States dollars. The stock has moved 730% north since the year started, over which the ZSE financial index has also moved by over 450%. Comparatively, the ZSE All Share Index has moved more than 415% over that period. The group has significant investors in it, among them NASA, which holds a 38% stake, as well as the Transnational Holdings, which occupies 21% of the group's shareholding. Now, some game-changing developments that have recently taken place. Over the past year, ZB opened a Bureau de Change, which is known as the Seifert's Bureau de Change as part of its diversification drive. Of note is that in a mouth-watering development, ZB Financial Holdings partnered a global player, the Rear Money Transfer, in a move meant to facilitate as well as enhance diaspora re remittances. On the cards is a diversification and expansion drive as ZB Reinsurance is seeking to expand the footprint of the organization into Mozambique. Now, this concludes the Halaju section of our show tonight. In just a moment, we will cross over to an earlier conversation we had with the group chief executive, Mr. Ron Mutandagai. Now, don't go anywhere. 
good day, Ron, and thank you for joining us on the earnings review. Good day, Eben. Thanks for having me. Beautiful. Um, now, Ron, you, uh, within a short space of time, released a trading update as well as your results for your performance in 2019. So I want us to touch a little bit on mm -hmm. both ends, your trading update as well as your financials for 2019. So to, uh, to get started, let's dive into your 2019 financials. Would you want to just in a nutshell highlight your performance over the past year? Well, I think um, we have held our own under very difficult circumstances, as you would appreciate, uh, the level of inflation has been increasing. Being a financial institution and holding monetary assets obviously means that uh, there will be a loss of value. Uh, as you can see in our numbers, uh, our statement of financial position went down by 14%, uh, which suggests that uh, we lost uh, money uh, on uh, holding monetary assets. Uh, in terms of inflation adjusted accounts. When you look at our earnings, um, they went up about 224% inflation adjusted terms, uh, which means that, uh, you know, we've been managing the business uh, as best we can under the circumstances. Uh, I think it is absolutely critical in this environment for businesses like ourselves to try and see how best you can preserve value that means that you need to look at ways and means of moving out of monetary assets into non-monetary assets, but complying with the rules and regulations uh, of the Reserve Bank. Um, we, as a business, are looking at property development as one area that will allow us to be able to preserve value. Um, certainly, our building society will play a big part in that uh, effort. Um, and uh, we've got um, property in Bite Bridge, uh, consisting of 150 stands. We've just finished um, putting up uh, de demo units, uh, three of them, um, so that out of the 147 remaining stands, we'll be able to uh, sell those to the public. Uh, they will choose from the sample of the uh, demo houses that we've built. Um, in Hopeville in Bulawayo, we bought uh, some 64 stands. We're still in the process of trying to figure out how best we can uh, deploy uh, our funding in that area. So I think um, there's a heavy focus on non-monetary assets uh, so that we preserve value in view of the raging inflationary pressures that we're facing taking cover sounds pretty strategic but to get into <laughs> some of the, <laughs> um, yeah. to get into some of the key um, 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 indicators in your performance your net interest narrowed from 199 million dollars in 2018 to 146 in uh, 2019 in inflation adjusted terms what mm. drove that very mm. development well i think interest income as you know uh, is a major issue uh, as far as uh, the public as well as the authorities are concerned. Um, we've not been able to uh, respond to the inflationary pressures uh, by way of increasing our interest rates. Um, so our net interest, interest margin has remained pretty much uh, constrained. Um, I think we're mindful of the fact that uh, the public uh, feels that banking products are very expensive. Uh, so, you know, we are also very, very careful when we look at our tariff to ensure that we do not go uh, and push people over the edge. Um, uh, so I think it is a combination of uh, interest rates uh, plus uh, the uh, volume of business that we've had to transact in that area. Um, 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 I get the sense, but given the fact that we've got um, a, an economy that is already pointing south, exacerbated by mm. the pandemic, mm. how do you intend to navigate yeah. that very matrix there? I think that's, it's, it's going to be very difficult and going to be very interesting. I think one of the first things that one needs to do is to look at their revenue generation capacity. What can you do in this environment that keeps your revenue going up? We're looking at um, alternative uh, revenue generation areas. We're looking at um, increasing our business uh, in the 
um, space of uh, corporate finance. Uh, we are working with a number of institutions at the moment uh, who have come to us uh, for purposes of uh, capital raising. We've increased our advisory business. Uh, in this environment, uh, there are quite a lot of people that are looking for advice, be it advice to grow their businesses, be it advice to go into greenfield operations, or indeed advice to uh, scale down their operations. Uh, so I think there's quite a lot of business that is coming out of that advisory space, notwithstanding the fact that the economy uh, is not doing as well as it should. In addition to that, uh, we are pushing a property development so that we are able uh, to conserve value uh, during this uh, very difficult period. But also, uh, we need to look at our uh, cost lines. Uh, we are doing that very aggressively uh, in terms of looking at the services that we um, buy in. Uh, at what cost are those uh, services being bought in? Is that price fair? If it's not, we are negotiating very, very aggressively. You will recall that in the 2007-2008 period, when a lot of service providers have gone into charging either by way of fuel coupons or uh, foreign currency, uh, we had to insource uh, a lot of uh, services that we bought. Uh, so we are relooking at that to see whether there is benefit in insourcing uh, as a way of conserving the precious little foreign currency uh, that we are earning. Uh, another area we are just working very hard on is there, Ron, um, um, I, I want us to look at another um, key um, matrix there. You closed the year with a liquidity of 88%. Um, How are you maximizing value yes. from these excess funds? Well, I think um, it's difficult in an inflation environment uh, for a monetary asset to perform as well as you would want it to. Uh, the greater portion of that liquidity is actually our stock of treasury bills um, and uh, we do use that for purposes of uh, securing our positions um, and we try and deploy excess liquidity as much as we can by way of lending uh, to sectors that are performing uh, we're also looking uh, at uh, uh, tying up funds with uh, counterparties uh, that will be able to support us in future We've got excess liquidity at the moment. Somebody might want to borrow uh, to undertake a project. It may not make um, commercial sense for us to lend to them, but because we'll create that uh, tightness of relationship with that particular person uh, when good times come in. Uh, so we are using that as a relationship building uh, for the future. And now that you mentioned treasury bills, you had treasury bills to the tune of over 200 million Zimbabwe dollars. What is the maturity mm. dates of those very treasury bills in a nutshell? Well, a good, a good number of them are short-term treasury bills, um, but you do have the Zamco uh, TBs that we got a few years ago that went up to about 12 years. Uh, this is now three years down the road. So the tenors range between uh, 180 days up to about um, eight, uh, eight and a half years now. But the majority of our TBs are uh, between uh, 180 days and up to uh, one year, two years. So they are short term uh, in nature. Fair enough. Now to uh, zero in on your most recent trading update um, dated the 31st of March 2020. Um, we noticed that there was a 35% reduction in terms of the volume of the transactions that you processed. What fed into that very um, index in that regard? Well, I think um, the number of transactions uh, have been coming down, as you probably would be aware, uh, because of the shortage of cash on the market. Uh, most people tend to have uh, uh, um, prefer to go uh, mobile. Uh, so obviously, uh, as financial institutions, we tend to lose uh, the transactions count. Um, you know, when most people go into supermarkets these days, uh, they are using uh, mobile methods uh, of payment. Uh, and, um, you know, we are trying to push uptake of our particular products, which is where Zipit became very, very important for us as financial institutions. 
and that uh, uptake of ZPD has increased. Uh, but obviously, you then come across the issues around limits uh, because with inflation, your basket for somebody who's in a supermarket is exceeds the limits uh, on a day to day basis. Interesting. Now, talk about um, your non performing loans um, ratio. Um, historically, you had d developed a reputation of being known for um, a, for a, a very bad matrix in that regard, uh, heating up to sure. as far as much as 24. And in your most trade, mm. recent trading update, that narrowed down from um, mm. about 4.6% in 2018 to 1.3% mm. in um, 2019. Mm. And in March, it hit about 1.3%. Um, what has yeah. influenced that very change? Well, um, I don't think we had a reputation for bad lending. <laughs> I think it was just the nature of the economy that we were operating in. Uh, and I think a lot of banks uh, faced that non-performing loans problem. Um, we went on ours very, very aggressively. Uh, we recovered uh, loans from uh, debtors who had had difficulties. Uh, we also undertook debt workouts because some of the reasons people were not able to honor their obligations was because they got stretched and then they didn't have the liquidity to be able to continue operating. So debt workout was actually very, very important. The third component of it was naturally um, um, the uh, Zamco uh, uptake of some of the debts that we had. Uh, but after the cleanup, uh, we would then went back and ensured that our risk management uh, processes were tightened up. Um, you know, currently we are lending on the back of security, which is lended property, TBs, uh, or cash, uh, to ensure that we do not have a recurrence uh, of the non-performing loans problem that uh, we had in the past. Crystal clear. Now, on to the issue of meeting the, mim the minimum requirements for capitalization, you have been emphatic that you intend to keep it at um, tier one. Um, how yeah. is that working in terms of ensuring that you are in tune with that very requirement? We are looking at that even. I think the um, group is uh, desirous, as you say, of maintaining a tier one financial institution. Uh, we were hoping to trade up to that level, and I'm sure that we will be able to earn some profits uh, that will allow us to uh, add to capital that we have. It does look like we may have to resort to a capital call uh, if uh, the exchange rates keep moving the way that they are. Uh, we are in discussions with our shareholders around that. Uh, and uh, we are also sharpening our eye cap uh, at the moment uh, just to see what that gap looks like. Uh, we are also considering, as you may remember, uh, the consolidation of our building society yes. and our bank uh, yes. as a way of minimizing uh, the capital call on our shareholders. And, and how is that going and what will happen? Uh, where we are at the moment is we've put in an application with the regulatory authorities uh, seeking to combine the two uh, entities uh, and the RBZ is considering that application. We do hope to hear from them sometime soon. Once they do, we will then undertake the process uh, through the normal corporate processes where we'll go back to the board of directors, get it approved, get it approved by a shareholders meeting. Uh, and then we undertake the usual advertisements around uh, amalgamation of business entities. So we do think that if the authorities get back to us soon, uh, it's something that we should be able to complete by 30 September uh, 2020. Um, I do hope that that goes on to ZB Reinsurance. Um, the unit has rebounded into a profit position mm. against the backdrop of, of, of a loss. What fed the change of the narrative? Uh, ZB Reinsurance has actually never really been in a loss position. Um, it's been operating uh, quite well. Uh, we, as you know, underwrite business from the region, uh, Mozambique, Kenya, Malawi, Zambia, and so on. Uh, we were facing some difficulties because of our currency dynamics here in Zimbabwe. 
uh, and a lot of our citizens in the region were becoming uncomfortable about paying money into uh, Zimbabwe because they feared that if there was a claim, we may have difficulty in uh, settling those claims. So what we did, working with regulatory authorities, was we sought dispensation to bank some of the premiums um, uh, in those countries so that when we come off risk, uh, you know, that cash then becomes cash on our position, which we will then use to make, um, to settle claims as and when they uh, arose. But we've gone one step further. We've said to ourselves, let's look at setting up in the region. Uh, we are currently exploring the possibilities of uh, registering a company in Botswana. Uh, we have done our homework. Um, an application is uh, in the process of being considered uh, by the non-bank financial institutions regulatory authority of Botswana. We've also got uh, approval from the RBZ. Uh, so it's something that we hope should be sorted out, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, uh, so that we've got an entity that operates uh, outside this domicile, which can then underwrite business from other countries than Zimbabwe, uh, so that we uh, do not uh, commingle Zimbabwe risk with regional risk. Um, I, if my memory serves me well, you had also indicated interest into Mozambique. Is, is that right? Yes, that's right. Uh, How is that? Uh, what we wanted to do at that time was to, to set up presence in Mozambique. Uh, then they were hit by that cyclone okay. uh, about two or three years ago. So we then felt that um, it was better to establish a regional office rather than uh, one uh, outlet in Mozambique. Uh, so that has since been overtaken by events. Uh, the current position is that we are setting up an operation um, uh, from Botswana. Um, makes a lot of sense. Now on to ZB Life Assurance. Um, it seems there is a growing demand for cover in harder currencies. How are you responding to that? <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, I think, <laughs> well, what we're seeing with ZB Life Assurance is that uh, normal insurance products don't do well in a hyperinflationary environment. Uh, people are not able to save, uh, even if you invest the money. I mean, as you can appreciate, uh, latest inflation rate is 765%. Our interest rates are nowhere near that. So it means that people are losing value. So we're finding that um, people are not insuring to that extent. What seems to have taken off is the uh, cash funeral business. Uh, and we are uh, ramping that up. Um, we sell our product through ZB Bank outlets. Uh, we are currently looking at a diaspora product. As I speak to you a few days ago, we got authority from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe to launch a diaspora product uh, for the group. That diaspora product will cover insurance, uh, it will cover mortgages, it will cover investments, uh, and uh, we think that that will assist in diversifying our income streams and also putting our business in better stead going forward. Interesting. And how does that <laughs> partnership with uh, RIA, RIA Money Transfer? It's going very well. It's going very well. We're beginning to get um, uh, remittances from North America. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're quite excited about that. We've also gone into partnership with another transfer agent called Small World. Uh, in addition to the traditional world remit and Mukuru, um, we are doing roaring business in terms of remittances. Uh, and we're quite excited about the partnerships that we have uh, entered into uh, with all those um, counterparties. Um, but in terms of getting the, the word out, has it been publicized mm -hmm. enough? Have you made enough noise about it um, so that you solidify your presence in that market? Because as you rightly mentioned, there are other players, Mukuru and, and, and sure. the like. Have you yeah. made enough yeah. noise as far as the product yeah. is concerned? Well, we, we do advertise in partnership with those counterparties. So uh, ZB Bank and World Remit. Uh, you know, we exchange information, uh, they give us advertising collateral, uh, they advertise in their domestic market, we advertise here. Uh, I think with the new diaspora product that we have, 
uh, we will be able to shout uh, out louder from rooftops about all the services that we offer in those um, destination countries that we're operating in. Well understood. Now, to talk about um, your investment in Mashuna Land Holdings, how strategic is that in mm -hmm. investment? Very strategic to the ZP Financial Holdings Limited Group. As you'll appreciate, um, we've got an indirect shareholding through ZP Life Assurance, together with a direct shareholding from ZP Financial Holdings Limited. All told, we own at least 30% of Mashuna Land Holdings Limited. Um, as I indicated, in this environment uh, of high inflation, you require non-monetary assets, and that's where the Mashonan Holdings Limited plays a very big part. They are involved in a number uh, of development projects, uh, which will assist us in preserving value as a group. Um, and we are quite excited about uh, a few of the opportunities that we have uh, been discussing. Um, there is an opportunity to the Shavane, uh, which we are pursuing uh, together with the Minister of National Housing. Uh, if that uh, comes to fruition, we will be able to revamp uh, the Zishavane Town Centre. Um, we are looking at uh, properties in Rua, as well as in Bluffhill. Uh, and uh, we are quite excited about our association with Machine Holdings Limited. That will assist in preservation of value for our shareholders. Quite enlightening there. And now, how has Cyphers uh, taken off? You, according to my recollection, you launched that in May of 2019. Yeah. How has been the response of the that offering there? The Bureau of the Shanghai is doing very well. Um, you will remember that we were the first uh, bank uh, to launch off-site Bureau of the Shanghai's uh, in partnership with retailers. <laughs> Uh, that did very, very well at the initial stages of um, the introduction of that uh, business model. Uh, but as time went on, because of the changes in the foreign exchange regime, uh, we, we are finding that it's becoming very, very competitive. Uh, we do still run a number of outlets under the Cyphrets uh, Bureau de Change and name, in addition to also running um, exchange con uh, exchange uh, business within our branches uh, up and down the country. Um, fair enough. And of course, you have uh, time and time again in our conversations, Ron, if you recall, alluded to your investment and progress on a digital front. Um, can you give yes. us an update in terms of how you have been faring? Yeah. And I think the last time, I think you dropped a figure of about 20 million, which you said you intended to invest. Absolutely. Where mm. that yeah. feels we, concerned. Yeah, we're looking at uh, digitalizing our business. Um, and the budget has been set at uh, US $20 million. Um, naturally, because of the current... Uh, circumstances the country finds itself in, it's very difficult to mobilize that kind of money. And so we are having to conduct uh, small projects uh, that uh, work towards the entire digitalization project. We've recently invested in an electronic service bus uh, called an ESB that allows us to be able to integrate uh, with third parties uh, very, very easily. Uh, so that's operating uh, quite well. We're upgrading our card um, management system, which is called Smart Vista, uh, to improve on its capability. Uh, we are working on uh, an impending upgrade in our core banking system. Uh, and uh, we have uh, put up uh, um, requests for proposals, uh, which closed uh, at the end of May, they were initially supposed to close at the end of March, but because of the COVID uh, issues, we extended the uh, deadline. So we will be in the process of looking at uh, what comes out of that to allow us to be able to uh, revamp our core banking system. So we will go piece by piece, uh, but we will achieve the ultimate objective of digitalizing the business uh, in the near future. Fair enough. And since you have been removed from uh, the OFAC uh, sanctions, what benefits have you reaped from that very development? 
Well, uh, you recall that we were removed from sanctions on 4 October 2016. Um, we've been able to uh, mobilize lines of credit uh, from uh, international partners. Uh, as I speak to you, we've mobilized uh, a total of 40 million US dollars um, from international partners for onward lending uh, to a number of uh, local entities. Um, so that has helped quite a lot. Uh, it means that, you know, we were able to reopen our correspondent banks. Uh, we now operate a US dollar account, a British pound account, a euro account, as well as a land account. That means that we are now able to make payments on behalf of our customers uh, throughout the whole world with no let or hindrance. Uh, in the very near future, we are working on the reintroduction uh, of um, Visa card, uh, which will allow our customers to be able uh, to enjoy convenience when they travel outside the country. So all in all, the removal from sanctions has been very, very positive uh, for the group. Um, as we ready to wrap up, as we are almost out of time, what is the strategy in terms of um, your mortgage uptake for 2020? Um, we are looking at um, increasing our book uh, to uh, something in the region of uh, 250 million uh, Zimbabwe dollars. Uh, we are in engagement with the Ministry of National Housing for the purposes of getting land to allow us to be able to then develop those stands, put up uh, houses or uh, factory shelves, and then sell that on mortgage uh, to customers. Uh, so if we do get land, as I've indicated, we've got 150 stands in Bybridge, we've got 64 stands in Hopeville in Bulawayo, and we continue to engage uh, local authorities uh, in the length and breadth of the country uh, to allow us to be able to buy land for us uh, to offer mortgages for construction. Well, um, thank you so much, Ron. That was quite enlightening and very much comprehensive. Right. Um, it's always a pleasure getting to talk to you on the progress that you are making. Thanks, Ivan. Thanks very much for having me. M much appreciated. You have yourself a great evening. Likewise. Good day. Thank you. Welcome back, viewers. That was, of course, uh, the chief executive of ZB Financial Holdings. And now joining me for an analysis on the operations of the entity is our in-house analyst, Respect Quincy. Respect, good evening, and thank you for joining us on the earnings review. Thank you, Eben, and uh, good evening to you too. Thank you. Um, the writing is on the wall. Ron is quite clear there that they are taking cover. They are turning to assets as a means of value preservation. How important is that very drive in that regard? I think it's uh, market-wide, especially for uh, those companies that deal with liquidity. There's obviously that high exposure to inflation and therefore looking at avenues of preserve, or preserving that value actually augurs well with the aspect of preserving shareholder value. So uh, we are seeing almost all banks trying to get into that space where they get into real assets as a way of hedging uh, the inflationary environment. Some are actually going into uh, the stock market and uh, related investments just as a way of cushioning themselves against the vagaries of inflation. Because uh, with hyperinflation coming in at almost six, 766 years at April, I think it's no longer as safe. Or in fact, you continue to lose value if you keep your money just in monetary assets. So I think it's that movement towards uh, um, assets like real assets, which tend to protect value in these harsh times. But I think uh, for most banks, it shouldn't be a long-term strategy. You have to get to a point where you also start to unwind and get back to your core business, which is lending and, uh, of course, other uh, non-funded non, non uh, income lines. But basically, uh, this is a short-term way of preserving value. And I think I, th I wouldn't think of any other way of preserving value in such an environment. But talking about lending, we have seen vacillations and oscillations where interest rates are concerned. In the short term, given, of course, what we are seeing from the pandemic aspect of things, how can banks navigate this very turbulence? 
Yeah, I think there's always, there are always two sides to it. You also have to be in line with what regulation says. So you're regulated by the RBZ and obviously your core mandate should be in lending activities. So you have to be seen to be lending to up to some, to some point. But at the same time, you've got shareholders on the other end who want their value to be preserved. And you also have got depositors in that matrix. So I think it's always about uh, finding a balance. But uh, I think broadly, uh, lending activities are not yielding the desired results of a possibly net positive interest in composition when you then factor in the impact of inflation. So it's, it's, it's about um, finding a balance. But in between, you also have to utilize some of your uninvested assets into some ways of protecting this value so that it counters the losses that you're realizing in, uh, in, 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 the, in the funded income space. But yeah, you're right. I mean, there's been that, those oscillations, but basically we first saw RBZ putting in a higher interest uh, rate, a benchmark rate actually, and banks responded by adjusting their rates upwards mid of last year. And then by the end of the year, uh, that had slowed down when RBZ anticipated that possibly uh, inflation might actually settle down at a lower rate. But I think getting into 2020, we are seeing higher inflationary pressures. And obviously, that calls for RBZ again to try to seek ways of closing this gap between the hyperinflation and pres preservation of depositors' money. Failure to do so actually creates room for uh, uh, speculative activities and so forth. And this actually leads to speeding up of uh, uh, exchange rate uh, depreciation and even inflation itself. So I think uh, banks are caught in between the desire to keep themselves in line with regulation and also the desire to preserve value. But in between, it's, it's all about finding a balance and finding other ways of preserving value. Talking about finding ways, at the moment, uh, as Ron carefully indicated, they are working toward meeting the tier one, uh, which is a $30 million minimum uh, capital regulation. And they are working on bringing together ZB Building Society as well as ZB Bank. How important is that move? Um, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't really know whether it's really uh, the best thing that they could possibly have done. Uh, but in the current circumstances where possibly we are now looking at a U.S. dollar value at a certain debt, I think it's, it's, it's very paramount to create a very strong base that is uh, in terms of your capitalization. When you're well capitalized, it's, it's very easy to navigate the current crisis. But I think there's scope for mortgage business in Zimbabwe. It's, it's not like they are completely going outside of that uh, uh, co mandate but rather they're simply consolidating that into a commercial bank and they're still going to be lending within that that that, that premise so i think um the benefits that comes with having a separate entity which deals with mortgage business i think it's mainly to do with taxation but when you then get to get to all commercial banks they have got these uh home equity loans and so forth these products this speaks to the mortgage side of, of, of their business and they are able to really navigate through. So rather, uh, consolidating brings down the cost. That is the cost of definitely managing those two businesses and also the capitalization. So I think it's a way of uh, actually increasing their uh, strength as a bank in terms of uh, baseline uh, 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 capitalization. And how can they navigate the insurance aspect of, of business? I mean, in the face of inflation and instability where interest rates are concerned, how does that tie into the strategy of the group going forward? I think there, there have been quite some uh, fundamental developments in the economy which calls for a revision to some of these uh, IPEC guidelines, especially to do with uh, uh, taking US dollar uh, denominated uh, um, premiums. So I think we are getting to a position where we might see uh, IPEC revising these, these, these kind of statutes. And what it simply means is that if you're also providing USD cover, then you're quite guaranteed in terms of, uh, in terms of your retain and so forth. So uh, I think we're moving towards a point where we might see uh, the, 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 the broader uh, sector in terms of the in terms of the uh, in terms of the insurance actually moving in line with what's happening in the in the economy. 
I realize. Well, thank you so much, respect for the perspectives. Thank you, viewers, for staying with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and to visit our informative website, www.equityaccess.net. From the Equity Access team and I, Dangi and ciao.